In the spirit of learning continuously, sometimes you will encounter problems that do not test your coding skills primarily. It does not matter how well do you know data structures or how good of a code you can write. Sometimes it is just about the logic you are taking and how are you solving a problem. That means we are testing out your problem solving skills. Once the problem is set zeros in a matrix on lead code. So you're given a matrix and you have to set zeros in rows and columns based on a certain condition. Correct? Let us see what we can do about it. Hello friends, welcome back to my channel. First, I will explain you the problem statement and we will look at some sample test cases. Going forward, we will try to approach this problem in a brute force way and see its limitations. Then we are going to optimize it step by step. First, we will optimize it according to time and then we are going to optimize it according to space. After all of this, we will also do a dry run of the code so that you can understand how all of this actually works in action. Without further ado, let's get started. First of all, let's make sure that we understand the problem statement correctly. In this problem, you are given a m cross n matrix that has some integers, right? Now, you have to output a resultant matrix such that if any element is zero, you have to convert all the other elements in the same row and in the column to zero as well. So what does this actually mean? Let us look at our first test case. So you are given this matrix, right? And this has some integers. According to the problem statement, if you find any zero in the matrix, then you need to convert all the other elements in the same row and in the same column to zero as well, right? So for this particular test case, your resultant matrix will look something like this, correct? Similarly, let us look at our test case number two. In a test case number two, once again, we have a very big matrix, right? And if you check the zeros, I have two zeros in here. What I need to do is I need to convert all the other elements in the same column and in the same row to zeros. So for a second test case, this matrix will be our answer, right? So this is what you have to do primarily in this problem. However, there is one challenge. The only challenge in this problem is, can you do all of this in place? In place simply means that you are not allowed to take any extra space to arrive at your answer. So now, if you feel that you have understood the problem statement even better, feel free to try it out first. Otherwise, let us dive into the solution. A good developer will always try to come up with a brute force solution first, because then he can verify that, hey, a solution to a problem exists. So what is the most naive way that you can approach this problem? Let us say you are given this sample matrix, right? And I have to find out a resultant matrix. The first way could be that, okay, I make an extra matrix where I will store all of my temporary results, right? And then what I'm going to do is I will traverse each element one by one. If an element is zero, what I can do is I can simply copy it in my new matrix, right? Next, when I move to the second element, I will just check if I find a zero in the same row. If yes, I will simply write down this element as zero. Similarly, I will go on to my next element and once again, I check my row. I find a zero over here. So, okay, I will once again write a zero and then I can copy the zero straight away to my new matrix. So this is how you populate one row. Similarly, you can go over each column as well. You will look at the next element three, right? You check if you find a zero anywhere in the row. No. Do you find a zero anywhere in the column? Yes. So what you will simply do is you will write down a zero over here and then move on to your next element. Once this matrix is filled, it will look something like this, correct? And what you can do is you can simply copy all of these elements back to your original matrix or you can return this new matrix, right? And this solves your purpose. This is the correct answer. But do you see the problem with this approach? In this approach, to identify the state of my new element, I have to traverse the entire row and all the columns again and again, correct? For every element, you will have to traverse the row and then look at the column, right? So this ends up taking a lot of time. Hence, this is not a desired solution. What can we do about it? Let us try to start optimizing it. Cool. To begin our optimization journey, once again, I take up the same test case, right? And in a brute force solution, what was taking up the maximum time? We took a lot of time traversing through all the rows again and again, right? Just to determine if we have any zero in there. And we did the same for columns. So you should try to think around that. 
you need to find a way such that you can store that result and you're not evaluating it every time. So what I can do is I can take up some temporary space just to store that, hey, this row has a zero and this column has a zero. So you can see that I take up two areas to store all of this interim result. What I will simply do is I will traverse through my first row. I see, do I see a zero in here? Yes. So I will simply mark a true in here. Correct. Now move on to the next row. I do not see a zero in here. So I will mark this as false. Similarly for the third row and similarly for the fourth row. Now do the same exercise for each of the columns. In the first column, I can see a zero over here, right? So I will mark this value as true. I cannot see a zero in the second column. So I mark it as false. No zero in the third column either. And I can see a zero in the fourth column over here. So I mark this value as true, correct? Now things become very, very easy. What you will do is you will start to traverse each element one by one. And for each element, you will just check do you find a true anywhere in the row or do you find a true anywhere in the column? If you find a true, what you're going to do is you will replace this element with a zero, right? So now move on to the second element. You check its row. You see a value true over here. That means there was a zero somewhere. So what I will do is I will simply replace this value with zero. Now move on to the next value. You see a true once again over here. So just replace this value with zero. The next value is already zero, so move ahead. Now move on to the second row. You see the element three. Check the Boolean value for its row. This value is false. It simply means that no zero exists in the row. You don't have to check it again. So you're saving time over here. And check if you find a true in the column value. You find a true over here, that means there is a zero. So you need to just simply write down zero over here. Now move on to the next value. You see a seven. Once again, just check these two values. If one of them is true, that means there is a zero. If both of them are false, that means there is no zero in the entire row or in the entire column. So if both of them are false, just copy the value as it is. So just keep on doing this for each value in the original matrix. And what you're going to do is you will replace the values as and when required. Ultimately, your matrix will start to look something like this. And you can see this will be your answer, correct? So with this approach, we also achieved two more outcomes. First of all, we saved a lot on time, right? Because we are not iterating to the entire matrix again and again. And the second advantage we got is we are doing all of this in place. We are not taking an additional matrix to store some temporary rewards. We are modifying the contents of this original matrix, right? So we achieved two outcomes, but we took some extra space to store this intermediate results, right? So that is one area where we can still optimize. So how can we go about optimizing even this? When you're trying to optimize, you first have to identify what do you want to optimize. In the brute force solution, we were optimizing for time, right? Hence, we figured out a solution by taking a help of some extra array that can store our intermediate results, correct? Now you want to optimize for the space that you're taking. You take some extra space just to store all your intermediate results, right? And that is what you want to optimize. So once again, let us take up our same example and we will try to optimize for space as well. And there is a very neat little trick which you can use to optimize for your space. So from our previous example, we took some extra space to store intermediate results, right? What you can do over here is in this example, you can use your first row of the matrix and the first column of your matrix to store all of these similar results. I'm going to show you how you can do it in just a little while. So now what we're going to do is just treat this inner matrix as your sample matrix and iterate over each row one by one. So when you iterate over each row, if you find a zero anywhere over here, what you're going to do is you will mark this first value as zero. And this simply means that the value of false. And then you will be able to relate it to the previous example. In the next row, I do not find a zero over here. So let this be one. In the next row, once again, I cannot find a zero. So let this be eight. So when I went through my first row, I found a zero over here. So what I'm going to do is I will mark this value as zero. 
So once I mark this value as zero, I see a zero over here, right? When you go through your second row, you do not find your zero, so do not do anything. Go through the third row and once again, you do not find a zero, so leave out this value. Now do the same thing for each column. Look at this column. You do not find a zero, so leave out this value. Go through this column. You find a zero over here, right? So replace this value with zero and your matrix should look something like this. Go through the third column and you do not find a zero. So don't do anything with this cell yet, right? The next step will be to copy all the zeros that you already had in your first row and your first column. So I had two more zeros over here, right? So I will copy this zero and I'm going to copy this zero, right? You can see that some of these values are unchanged, right? But wait for it. We will ultimately arrive at our answer. Now you have completed one iteration of your matrix, right? In the second iteration, once again, start traversing each element one by one. And this time you are going to follow the approach that we just took in our previous example. If you're looking at this first element that is four, just look at the column index and the row index. If any of them is zero, that means there is a zero somewhere in the row or in the column. So what I'm going to do is I will replace this value with zero. Now, as soon as you see a zero, don't do anything about it because it is already a zero. Now move on to your next value. That is two. Once again, look at the first row and the first column. If you find a zero anywhere, that means there was a zero somewhere. So I'm going to convert this value again to zero. Move on to your next value. That is three. Now look at the row index. That is one. That means there is no zero anywhere in the row. Look at the column. That is one again. That means there is no zero in the column as well. So this value is going to remain unchanged. And I will write down three over here, right? Look at the next value one. Compare these two indexes. You find a zero. So replace this value and put a zero in here. Look at the next value five. Now compare these two values. You find a zero. So what I'm going to do is I will replace this five again with a zero. Look at the next value seven and look at these two indexes eight and one. None of them is zero. So that means this value will be retained and it will be seven. The last two values will also be converted to a zero. Just try to do this as an exercise. Now you have completed 80% of the problem. The only remaining portion is the first row and the first column, right? Because we did not iterate through them, correct? To find out these values, what you simply need to do is just look at the first row and the first column. If you find a zero anywhere over there, just convert all of these values to zero. In this case, you can find a zero. So I'm going to simply write down zero in my first row entirely and zero in my first column. And you already have all of these values, right? And that's it. This will be our final answer. So we completed this problem in two steps, basically, right? In the first step, we took advantage of the first row and the first column as an extra space where we could store our intermediate results, right? Once we got these intermediate results, we were able to fill in the rest of the matrix, correct? And in the final step, what did we do? We just looked at our remaining first row and first column and replaced these values as required, correct? So you can see that we did not take any extra space that means in place. And also we were also time efficient. Now let us quickly do a dry run of the code and see how this works in action. On the left side of your screen, you have the actual code to implement this solution. And on the right, I have this sample matrix with me that is passed in as an input parameter to the function set zeros. Oh, and by the way, this complete code and its test cases are also available on my GitHub profile. You can find the link in the description below. Beginning ahead with a dry run, what is the first thing that we do? First of all, we create two Boolean variables that will mark if you find a zero anywhere in the first column or anywhere in the first row, right? But remember that we will use them at the very end, right? Next, what do we do? We iterate through our array to set our markers in the first row and first column, right? So when this loop runs, what will happen is it will look at the values in this inner matrix. And if it finds a zero anywhere in any column, it is going to replace this value with a zero. So in the second row as well, you find a zero. So this value will get replaced. Correct. 
So right now, what we have just done is we have determined the markers in our first column and in the first row. Now to move with an intermediate step, what do we have to do? We will replace our entire inner matrix, right? And to do this, we run a for loop that will look at this inner matrix and will compare these indexes as the markers. If it finds a zero anywhere, then all of these values will be marked as zero. And if it finds a zero here, all of these values will be marked as a zero, correct? So once this loop ends, this value becomes zero and all of these values will become zero because you found a zero here, here and here, right? Now moving ahead, we are just remaining with our last remaining checks, right? And that was that if you find a zero anywhere in the first row or anywhere in the first column, we do find a zero over here, right? And these are marked by the first row and the first column Boolean variables. We already did set them first time we were iterating through our original matrix, correct? And using this value, we will replace our remaining elements to zero. So once this loop ends, your resultant matrix will look something like this. The time complexity of this solution turns out to be order of m cross n because you are traversing through the entire matrix three times, right? And the space complexity of this solution will turn out to be order of one because you are not using any extra space and doing everything in place, right? I hope I was able to simplify the problem and its solution for you. As per my final thoughts, I just want to say that the most interesting bit about this problem is to do everything in place. When you have to do something in place, that means you cannot take any extra space. Sure, it is perfectly alright if you're just taking one extra space to store maybe some temporary value and then use it for swapping. That's perfectly fine. But if you're taking an extra array as a temporary space, that violates the concept of an in-place technique. So in-place mechanisms are very handy in tight situations when you're limited by space and in scenarios where you're not allowed to write new files. Think about it. There are also some sorting techniques which work in an in-place manner. So while going through your coding journey, have you found any other problems that worked in an in-place manner? What about the sorting techniques? How do they work? Can you find some instances that can be done in an in-place technique? While following this video, did you face any problems? Tell me everything in the comment section below and I would love to discuss all of them with you. On my website studyalgorithms.com, I have also covered a section on in-place techniques. Be sure to check it out. As a reminder, if you found this video helpful, please do consider subscribing to my channel and share this video with your friends. This motivates me to make more and more such videos where I can simplify programming for you. Also let me know what problems do you want me to solve next. Until then, see ya.